Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Rohr. I'm the manager of academic programs and outreach at GDC Archives. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar in the context of the Fred and Ellen Lewis GDC Archives Fellowship. I'd like to start today's program by saying a few words about GDC Archives. GDC Archives holds the records of GDC since its creation about 107 years ago. As a result, our archives is one of the most important repositories for the study of modern Jewish history. Um, researchers from around the world, as well as filmmakers, journalists, and others use our collection for their research. We also offer um, fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in our um, archives. One of these fellowships is the Fred and Ellen Lewis GDC Archives Fellowship which was established um, in, 20, in 2012 in tribute to Ellen Lewis, um, who was a German Jewish refugee who worked for GDC both in our Shanghai and New York office. Our speaker today, um, Dr. Jonathan Sizuk, is the recipient of the Fred and Ellen Lewis GDC Archives Fellowship for 2021. Dr. Sizuk is a visiting lecturer in sociology at the University of Pittsburgh, where he also serves on the Faculty of Jewish Studies. He received a PhD in sociology from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Dr. Sizuk's research has been supported um, by the Polish US Fulbright Commission, um, the Auschwitz Jewish Center in Oswiecim and the GDC archives. Um, his scholarship has appeared in the Journal of Classical Sociology, um, in the Religious Studies Review, and in the Studies um, in Contemporary Jury. The title of his lecture today is Passover for the Past Over Jewish Religious Life in Poland after 1968. Um, our format is the same as for all our webinar. The, Dr. Sizuk will talk for about 45 minutes. This will be followed by 15 minutes of question and answers. Please note that your microphones are muted. If you would like to send us questions, do so through um, the Q&A function on Zoom. And uh, you can send us questions at any time during the lecture. Um, Dr. Sizuk will now start his lecture. Thank you so much, Isabel, um, for those kind words of introduction. First, let me also uh, acknowledge this uh, wonderful fellowship that allowed me to conduct research at the JDC archives, some of which I will share with you today. In September 1979, the American psychologist Carl Rogers led a multi-day therapeutic and humanistic workshop in the Polish town of Waskajew, some 50 miles south of Warsaw. Over 100 people, psychologists and other professionals attended the workshop. After two days, as one of the participants recalled, Rogers recommended that the group split up into several special interest groups, which would include, for instance, parents, divorcees, and artists. At this point, someone suggested that a Jewish group should also be created. While the proposal was initially met with laughter, the first Jewish session was completely full. It was a revelation to the attendees that so many of their colleagues and friends were in fact Jewish, just as they were. To many participants, including underground journalist Konstanty Gebert, Jewishness was, quote, a guilty secret best kept private, end quote. Most of the individuals attending the Jewish sessions came from highly assimilated backgrounds, were born after the Second World War, their parents were to varying degrees committed to the communist project, intermarriage was the norm, and the family's Jewish origins were often concealed during or immediately after the Holocaust. If not for the events of March 1968, these individuals may never have discovered that they too were Jewish. One of the participants in the Jewish session, however, was not devoid entirely of a Jewish upbringing. 
While raised by devout communists, her parents had taught her Hebrew and secular Yiddish songs. This individual then taught the newly formed Jewish group some of these songs. And when the workshop was over, the participants marched to the train station, singing them out loud. The onlookers in the town were astonished. As Gebert recounts, quote, young people simply waved at us. Everybody likes to sing, but the elderly recognized the language and just stared unbelieving. They were seeing ghosts. On the eve of the Second World War, 1,476 Jews lived in the town of Waskaja, some 50% of the population. Only 17 survivors returned after liberation, and they quickly left in 1945 after three survivors were murdered by the Polish underground. The ghosts of a troubled past had indeed returned. But a few of those ghosts, perhaps as many as 6,000, according to Maciej Jakubowicz, never ceased identifying as Jews and remained in Poland after the events of March 1968. To be sure, as historian Michael Steinloff has emphasized, this was a tiny, aging, demoralized, and submissive Jewish community. But as a community, it persisted. The Jewish population was principally organized around the Religious Association of Mosaic Faith, or ZRVM, in its Polish acronym, and the Social and Cultural Association of Jews in Poland, Zet. The Religious Association was established in 1949 and was initially comprised of 23 state-authorized congregations across the country. By the 1970s, this number was reduced to 15 or 16 semi-functioning and nominally orthodox congregations with only four to five communities remaining consistently active with running synagogues, kosher kitchens, and kosher slaughter. This is an image of the Nozick Synagogue in Warsaw from 1969 uh, contained in the JDC archives. In 69 is the last time that this synagogue is used until 1983. This is one of the major centers, if you can call that at the time. In Poland, of course, there's also Kraków, which is still actively running. There's Wrocław, to some extent, there's the community in Lublin. There are also um, other smaller communities in parts of Western Poland, in places like Legnica, Gliwice, Szczecin, Katowice, um, Częstochowa, and so forth. But by the 1970s, these communities in Western Poland, parts of Poland that were formerly Germany before the Second World War, these are really quite diminished and the the more active communities are uh, concentrated in Warsaw, in Krakow, in Wrocław, and in Łódź, primarily. This is uh, an image from 1979 by the photojournalist uh, Chuck Fishman of Shabbat services in what was the, the base medrash, the Beit Midrash, next to the Nozhet Synagogue, which is at this time closed. You'll see in the man in front with a beard. This is Moshe Shapiro, who was a shochet, and we'll, we'll talk about him in a moment. You can see again the Nozhik Synagogue in the 1980s after the renovation. Uh, and this photograph was taken by the Jewish philosopher at the University of Warsaw, Stanislav Krajewski, who we will have uh, a chance to mention later today. In, in Kraków, you can see here probably the most famous uh, synagogue in Poland. This is the Ramah Synagogue. It's in continuous use throughout the communist period. It's in continuous use even after 1968. This is an image from the JDC archives from 1969. 
Here again, you see the Ramah Synagogue from 1978. The photograph was taken by Chuck Fishman. And again, the Ramah Synagogue uh, in the 1980s uh, during the Torah reading. During the 1970s, there were three elderly shochtim, ritual slaughterers in Poland, one in Kraków, uh, one in Wrocław, and one in Warsaw. The one in Warsaw was the aforementioned Mr. Moshe Shapiro. Here is an image of Moshe Shapiro waiting in line to get food after Shabbat services uh, in 1979. Here again is Mr. Shapiro in his apartment, very humble accommodations. In the 1980s, uh, the photograph was taken by Tomas Tomaszewski. And again, Mr. Shapiro, uh, who also served as a sort of a unofficial rabbi uh, and religious teacher in the absence of any rabbis at this uh, moment in time. This is quite a significant image, it's the, the young boy, this is, uh, Mateusz Kos. In 1984, he celebrated a bar mitzvah in Warsaw. This was a big deal. Today, he goes by Mati, and he's a rabbi uh, serving communities in the United Kingdom. In addition to shochtim, ritual slaughterers, there were also kosher butchers. Here is uh, Zygmunt or Srul Yisrael Varshaver from the 1980s. Uh, Zygmunt ran the last, the last kosher butcher shop in Warsaw in the Praga district. In the 1980s at this point, Mr. Shapiro uh, is not able to, um, to serve as a shochet anymore. And the community brings in a shochet, a ritual slaughterer from Budapest who comes once a month. And he and uh, Zygmunt Srul, they uh, oversee the slaughtering and then bring it to his butcher shop here in Warsaw. Here is another image of a butcher shop in Kraków from 1979, also taken by the photo journalist Chuck Fishman. Between 1966 and 1989, no permanent rabbi served the Jewish community. So you had ritual slaughterers, but you did not have uh, a rabbi. You also did not have a mohel in Poland. More or less, the religious association served the basic religious needs of a rapidly declining and aging demographic of quasi-observant Jews. In the mid-1960s, there were approximately 5,500 members. By 1974, there were only 1,319 members of the religious association who on average were in their mid to late 60s. No less young, the Social and Cultural Association, Tescajet, which served as the other main Jewish body recognized by the Polish state during the post-war years, it was no less young. The run by avowed communists, the Social and Cultural Association was formally endorsed by the government in 1950 with the mission of continuing secular Yiddish culture in Poland. Like the religious association, the Social and Cultural Association was severely reduced after 1968. 1968 being the date in which the Polish government instituted an anti-Jewish campaign. In the aftermath of the Six-Day War, the government ostensibly purged, the Polish government purged Jews from positions of authority, from law, from politics, from the academy, and uh, about half of the remaining Jewish population was expelled from Poland. So in the, in the aftermath of 68, both the Social and Cultural Association and the Religious Association were severely reduced. The Social and Cultural Association went from 34 branches in 1954 to just 17 in 
in the early 1970s. And like its religious counterpart, membership was reduced to about 1,300 people from over 7,000 in the mid 1960s. A shell of its former self, the Jewish community persisted along with the material support of the American Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC. While officially banned between 1967 and 1981, the JDC continued to support Polish Jewry through a Swiss registered front organization that was quietly tolerated by the relatively liberal government of Edvard Gierek that desperately courted foreign loans and hard currency from the West. JDC reports and correspondences paint a bleak picture of the Jewish community during this period. In 1972, Akiva Kohain, the JDC country director for Poland, referred to the Jewish community as, quote, the very small remnant of the remnants of Polish Jewry, end quote. Here you see Akiva Kohain with a doctor, Akiva Kohain, with a delegation um, at the Rappaport Monument in Warsaw in the probably the late 1980s. Kohain, himself a Polish Jew, was educated in Kraków before escaping the German invasion of Poland in 1939. Reporting in 1976 to the then newly appointed JDC head, Ralph Goldman, Kohain felt the pain acutely of, quote, this dying community, which was once one of the most important tribes in the House of Israel with such a glorious past, end quote. By 1980, the joint had determined that, quote, the end of the 1,000 years of the presence of Jews in Poland is not too distant, end quote. It was thus self-evident that there was little future for Polish Jewry. Unbeknownst to the JDC and the officially recognized Jewish organizations, that is, the social and cultural organization, sort of the Yiddish secular communists, and the religious association, the sort of quasi-observant Jews, who were also, to a large extent, communists. Unbeknownst to these organizations and the JDC, Konstanty Gebert and his cohort of then young shipwrecked Jews, as they called themselves, began exploring Jewish culture and identity. Moreover, even the so-called remnants of the remnants what Gebert would later more graciously call the, quote, old Jews, continued to be selectively engaged in religious and communal life. For the old Jews, attending the synagogue or celebrating a Passover Seder recalled a lost time and created a space for belonging and maintaining, however truncated and terminal, a Jewish identity. For the so-called new Jews of Gebert's generation, it opened brighter vistas for Jewish self-exploration and the reassertion of a hybrid Polish-Jewish identity that was largely extinguished in 1968. Holidays such as Sukkot or even Purim were scarcely observed after 1968. Walulavim and Etrogim were purchased from Italy and sent to Poland by the JDC. These religious items were not actually requested by the leaders of the religious association. And it is unclear if anyone beyond a few individuals used them. Sukkot was simply deemed overkill. It was not until the end of the 1980s, for example, that the Warsaw Jewish community resumed building a sukkah for the holiday. Not until 1986, according to a JDC document, was Purim publicly celebrated. By contrast, Passover, as well as the High Holidays, remained centrally important. Indeed, according to a JDC report, the quote, the congregation has neglected to celebrate Jewish holidays except the public sedarim 
for Pesach. And I say that in the and the Ashkenazi pronunciation, because that is what is contained in the document. In 1977, Kohen reported to Goldman that the religious association organized 13 separate Passover seders across the country, in which 475 people participated. This is not altogether a large number, but it is not insignificant either. Some Jews, of course, would also have conducted their own seders at home. Here's an image from 1979 taken by, again, by the photojournalist Chuck Fishman of a Passover seder in Warsaw. Um, you see um, the ceremonial washing of hands. Um, the, the person holding the cup and the basin is Solomon Klinghoffer and uh, the person whose hands are being washed is uh, Mr. Natan Tsiviak. Here is another image from the Passover Seder in 1979. This is Mr. Chapnik uh, pouring wine for the uh, Arba Kosot, the four cups of wine um, for the Passover Seder. Here again is another image of a Passover Seder in Warsaw from 1982 from the JDC archives. In Warsaw, it appears that only one Seder was celebrated publicly during much of the 1970s. But by 1979, the community organized a second Seder for the second night of Passover as well. This can be seen in the photograph taken by, by Chuck Fishman of Moshe Shapiro reciting the Haggadah with three children following the second Seder in 1979. In Krakow, by contrast, the community regularly hosted two Seders, one for each of the first two nights of the holiday. Naturally, many more people would also pick up matzah from the community's kosher kit canteens then participate in public seders. Here is Ruzha Yakubovich, who is the, the sort of mother of the Krakow Jewish community. Her husband, Mace, or mayor, was the head of the Krakow Jewish community. Her nephew, Cheswak, became the head of the Jewish community of Krakow when mayor or Mace passed away. And today, uh, her son, Tadeusz, uh, serves as the head of the Krakow Jewish community. Here you see. Um, uh, Mrs. Yakubovich serving a dish that she's prepared uh, for the Seder. Here you see uh, an image of Mr. Yanko Kuvaker uh, unpacking matzah for the uh, 1979 Seder in Warsaw. And here you see uh, an elderly woman, Leia Schmidt, in, at this point, well into her 90s, uh, eating matzah that was uh, distributed to her that she was able to get um, from the uh, Jewish community in Warsaw, which is, Baniocha is close to Warsaw. Uh, and, and this matzah, of course, is provided by the JDC. Every year, the religious association distributed approximately five to six tons of free matzah, as well as selling extra matzah to both non-observant Jews and non-Jews who, according to Kohen, bought matzah to, quote, use as crackers, as they are of much better quality and cheaper than those available in Poland, end quote. In the early and mid-1970s, the religious communities matzah baking machines were perpetually broken and arrangements had to be routinely made to ship both matzah and matzah meal to Poland, sometimes at the last minute. This is one of the more amusing, in a sense, um, paper trails in the JDC archives in that every single year, the Jewish communities of Warsaw, of Krakow, or Wrocław, they report to the JDC that the matzah machines are in need of repair. And every year in the 1970s, early 1970s especially, 
the JDC reports back, okay, we'll fix them, we'll send money um, through the Swiss uh, organization, uh, the front organization, or through somebody else, we'll figure it out. And, and this is a perpetual thing. And <clears throat> the Akiva Kohen is not really enthralled by any of this. Um, uh, clearly, there's some, there's some funny business going on, um, if you read between the lines, but um, Dr. Kohen more or less uh, tolerates it until the end of the 1970s, at which point the JDC dispenses entirely with paying to fix the matzah machines and instead arranges ahead of time for matzah to be shipped to Poland from various places, depending on the price and the exchange rate. Matzah would come from Hungary, from Holland, from Israel, and the United Kingdom principally. In 1976, at this point in 1976, the community is still using its own matzah machines and it produced and distributed approximately 18.5 tons of matzah and matzah meal, which is a lot of matzah. Four years later, in 1980, according to a JDC invoice, the Jewish community received over 20 tons of matzah and matzah meal. So we're talking about something like 45,000 pounds of matzah. To be sure, the increase in matzah distribution may have simply indicated the extent of rising food prices and food shortages in Poland, as well as the religious association's alacrity in turning JDC aid into a minor business venture. However, we also know from, ethnographic, from the ethnographic work of Ivona Irvin Zaretska in the early 1980s, that as many as several hundred people, many disillusioned old communists had returned to Judaism in the Warsaw Jewish community specifically. If there was one Jewish holiday that continued to be observed in Poland by the so-called old Jews, it was Passover. But it was not only the survivor population, the new Jews or the return Jews, as Erwin Zaretska termed them, they too looked towards traditional Jewish practice and learning as an entry point into their lost heritage. A few months after the Carl Rogers workshop in 1979, Konstanty Gebert and four colleagues founded the Jewish Flying University, or ZHUL in its Polish acronym, a semi-clandestine study group that explored Jewish cultural and historical topics, including the history of Hasidism, Freud, Kafka, and the Holocaust. The Jewish Flying University also served as a meeting space for Jewish activists, writers, actors, and intellectuals outside of the purview of both the communist state and the official Jewish organizations that were monitored closely by the state. This is uh, a Moshe Moses Moisesh Finkelstein. Um, he was the head of the religious association. He was based in Wrocław. Every two weeks, the group crammed, that is the Jewish Flying University, crammed into different apartments throughout the city of Warsaw until they were shut down with the imposition of martial law in December of 1981. The Jewish Flying University meetings were attended by several dozen participants, with 60 or more regulars, almost all of whom joined solidarity and were members of the anti-communist opposition. Approximately half of the participants were Jewish. The other half was comprised of mostly left-wing Catholics, many of whom were associated with the Catholic Intellectuals Club, or KEEK. It was in 1980 that this group began celebrating Passover together. The first time they organized a Passover Seder, it was held in the home of Stanislav and Monica Krajewski, co-founders of the Jewish Flying University and 
1981, as you see in this image from uh, taken by Tomasz Tomaszewski, the Seder was led by the Jewish historian, Michael Steinloff, who was then visiting from the United States. Here you see again, another uh, Passover Seder held at the home of the Krajewskis, this from 1984. In the previous image you hear, you can clearly make out that there's Mr. Konstanty Gebert. There's also Zbigniew Targielski, who later would go on by the name of Zev and other um, players in the emergence of Jewish life in Poland and especially in the post-communist uh, context. In addition to Passover, many of the Jewish participants also began observing Shabbat. Here you see an image of the philosopher Stanislav Krajewski reciting Kiddush on Friday night in perhaps 1981, I'm not sure of the date. But taking on uh, religious observance, taking on Shabbat observance was not because these individuals intended to be Orthodox Jews. Most did not. Rather, as Gebert noted, Jewish observance was a way of connecting to a past and fostering a community of belonging for young and politically active Jews who were shocked by 68, but refused to leave Poland. Asked why he didn't leave, Gebert responded simply, quote, I'm a Polish Jew, end quote. The implication being that nowhere else would his identity as a Polish Jew be recognized? Similarly, Stanisław Krajewski reiterated that while he suffered from people telling him, quote, get out of here, Jew, I didn't want to leave. So well, I stayed, end quote. But being Jewish in Poland did not come easy for this group of young Jews who were hardly accepted in official Jewish spaces. The young returnees were generally not welcome at Teskajet or ZRVM at the Social and Cultural Association or the Religious Association. The Social and Cultural Association looked down upon these quote unquote new Jews because they were members of a democratic opposition and were interested in religious practice. Teskajet, the Social and Cultural Association, was ideologically aligned with the United Workers Party and was ardently secular to the point that the Warsaw branch of Teskajet refused to host Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services on behalf of the Religious Association in 1981 to the great shock of the Deputy Minister of Religious Affairs of the Polish government, Tadeusz Dusik. In 1981, recall that the Nozick Synagogue is not yet in use, it's under repair. So the, the Jewish community of Warsaw, the religious community, quasi-observant community that would celebrate Jewish holidays, it, it had a small space. That, sm that small space next to the synagogue could not house the increasing numbers of people who are returning to some form of Jewish uh, observance, at least for the sort of main holidays. So the Finkelstein and Karnatsky, the head of the Jewish community in Warsaw, the, the religious community in Warsaw, they went to the Social and Cultural Association and they said, hey, you have much better facilities, you have a bigger space, would you let us use your space for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because we don't have enough space. And the Social and Cultural Association said, no way, no chance, not happening. This to the uh, deputy minister of religious affairs in the Polish government was, uh, was, was shocking, frankly. And it is this, this dialogue is preserved in the JDC archives. Back to the new Jews, these new Jews, they didn't know Yiddish. 
and to the social and cultural association Jews, to the Tascajet Jews, basically, you aren't Jewish if you didn't know Yiddish. As far as the religious association was concerned, Gebert and his company of younger Jews rediscovering their, Jewish, their Jewishness, well, they too were, were, deemed, were deemed dangerous. Almost all of them were a part of anti-communist opposition. And that, and having them in the synagogue might put a spotlight on these elderly Jews who wanted nothing more than to be left alone. The old timers somehow managed to keep Jewish religious life afloat more or less after the Holocaust and after 1968. And they believed that any serious challenge to the state control of Jewish institutions could spell the end to community life. This concern was not without reason. The state regulated all foreign contacts with international Jewish organizations, including especially the JDC. The Religious Association, as well as the Social and Cultural Association, were utterly dependent upon the state. Consequently, according to Gebert, the institutional Jewish community took great pains to make sure that nothing happened that would aggravate the government. And the secret police knew that they could count on Moses Finkelstein of Wrocław to self-police the community and report any disturbances. As Gebert put it matter-of-factly, quote, Finkelstein definitely didn't want us there, and I can fully understand him, end quote. Beyond these pragmatic concerns, there were additional aesthetic and demographic issues that made the religious association or the congregations unwelcoming. In general, the Jewish congregational facilities throughout the 1970s and into the 1980s were grim, they were gray, they were dirty and run down. Additionally, the members who regularly attended the synagogue or who ate at the kosher canteens were simply old, they were poor and seemingly unfriendly. Stanislav Karyevsky describes the negative experience he had when first going to the Warsaw Synagogue for Passover sometime in the 1970s. Quote, Monica and I were in the synagogue during Pesach for the first time, and afterward at the Seder at the Jewish Kehilla in Warsaw, that is the Gemina, or the Jewish community building. It made a horrible impression on us. The building was fit for demolition. The cafeteria was unspeakable. The cooks slobbering. And across from me sat an old man spilling his broth all over the table and his prayer book. Somebody, presumably a rabbi, was praying and bobbing when children suddenly appeared in the doorway. Sarah, come here, he shouted, and went on singing. We almost got up and left, and we didn't go back for years. We knew nothing then. We didn't know the ritual or what it was about, and we could see only the external form, which was more or less repugnant, end quote. By 1980, as I've already uh, mentioned, the Karyevskis dispensed with the communal Seder at the synagogue and hosted their own Seder for an extended group of approximately 15 young Jewish returnees. Throughout the 1980s, the Seder rotated between the Krajewski apartment and the Gebert apartment as they continued to, to develop their nascent Jewish identities. Eventually, both Krajewski and Gebert were accepted by the older synagogue Jews. The moment when they were fully embraced was in 1982. Christmas Eve fell on a Friday that year, and yet, both Krajewski and Gebert still attended Shabbat services. In 
the old timers were baffled and impressed. So impressed that one of the regulars went to the back and produced two bottles of vodka as a gift to the two young Jews and newest members of the community. As Gabbert reflected many years later, quote, no longer was our Jewishness just a reaction to external taunt or threat, end quote. They had asserted an independent Jewish identity out of their own volition in a uniquely shifting Polish context. That context was the late 1970s and the early 1980s. This was a period of relative intellectual openness and intense political ferment. With mounting foreign debt and a shrinking economy, the solidarity movement burst onto the scene in 1980 and galvanized huge numbers of people in opposition to government incompetence and widespread corruption. The success of solidarity to win major concessions from the state, including the right to protest and to form trade unions independent of the Communist Party, helped push Polish society to begin re-examining its official narratives. Martial law only partially suppressed Solidarity's broad anti-communist activity. A well-organized and widely distributed underground and sometimes increasingly mainstream media flourished during this period, which openly tackled previously taboo subjects, including the Katyn massacre and the history of Polish Catholic anti-Semitism and Polish Jewry more generally. In the midst of this radically shifting landscape, the Polish government officially welcomed the JDC back to the country in 1982. Shortly thereafter, in desperate need of national and international support, the government rededicated the Nozick Synagogue to serve as a showcase for the official ceremony commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Moreover, the Ministry of Religious Affairs now showed great interest in bringing rabbis back to Poland on a permanent basis, and even wanted the Jewish community to establish kosher restaurants in an attempt to promote tourism from the West. It is also at this point that the government began easing the state censor as it pertained to Jewish topics. A slew of articles, books, and journalistic pieces were written in the 1980s with government support or knowledge. Between 1980 and 1986, 170 books on the, quote, Jewish question were legally published in Poland according to an official state-sanctioned publication. This included Monika Krajewska's 1982 work, Czas Kamieni, or Time of Stones, which documented Jewish cemeteries across Poland. Krajewska, who was a founding member of the Jewish Flying University, published her work under the imprint of a major government press. In such an environment of what Gebert has called critical openness, increased participation of Jews at a Passover seders was not merely an expression of Jewish religiosity. It also had deep political implications. For most Poles, the Catholic church served as one of the only spaces that was semi-independent from the state. And during the 1980s, the church was increasingly associated with the democratic opposition. Joining a Seder or reciting Kiddush or attending the synagogue for the first time in many years could be understood as an expression of something quite similar. For some, Jewish observance in of itself was important. But for many other new and old returnees to Judaism, 
participating in Jewish communal life was an expression of both disillusionment with communism and an assertion of an independent identity beyond the state. The Jewish Flying University was characteristic of this larger cultural moment of questioning the blank spots of official communist history or the Yahweh Plame. That Passover, the holiday that recalls the ancient Israelites' deliverance from the shackles of slavery in Egypt, was the one regularly observed holiday by the various groups of Jews in Poland is all the more symbolically significant. All but forgotten and passed over, Polish Jewry continued to exist under communism. Jewish life did not come to a complete halt after 1968. It was depleted, repressed, and at times underground. But the beginnings of something more robust and sustainable emerged after the cataclysm of 1968, the fruit of which shapes contemporary Jewish life. Uh, thank you so much, and I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you, Yoni, for a fascinating um, lecture, really uh, very, very lively. Uh, I think we all felt uh, moved and um, thank you, really. Um, I so we're now going to open um, the floor to questions. Um, please remember that uh, your microphone are muted to send us questions via the Q&A function. And I see that we already have um, comments and questions. So I will, um, I will start um, by reading one of the comments and then you can decide to comment on the comment. Um, the survivor generation told me in the early 1990s that Yiddish and the experience of surviving the Holocaust were what made one a real Jew. So I think that kind of echoes um, what you said about the old, um, the old, older group, right? Yes, absolutely. I should add that they that this older group, the some of some of which part of the Social and Cultural Association, they published, uh, continued to publish in Yiddish. So they had the Folkstimme, uh, a Yiddish publication. And we, uh, they also, um, there was a Yiddish theater that continued to operate uh, in Warsaw as well. So to many Jews, right, that was, that's what Judaism was. That was, that was Yiddish culture, Yiddish language. And, and without Yiddish culture and Yiddish language, what's Judaism? Um, okay, so now to the questions. Um, someone sent two questions. Uh, the first question is, how does the existing research inform your work on the topic? This is the first question. And um, and the set, let's start with the first question and then I will ask you the second question. Okay, um, great. So existing research. So uh, I think I saw Rachel Rothstein on the list so she has written, a historian's written a fabulous article on the Jewish Flying University. That's sort of a, a go-to, a starting, a starting place, I would say. Her, re, her research uh, is excellent um, and uses a lot of the same sources from the JDC. Um, so that's, that's one. There are also some Polish scholars, though not, not a ton. To a large extent, this is a sort of an unstudied uh, a subject because the historiography on Polish Jewry ostensibly ends in 1968 or 1970. Um, you see sort of passing references to Jews after 1968, but for most scholars, um, there simply is nothing to really comment about. But I hope I problematized that a bit in today's talk, that there is something to talk about if the comparison point is the pre-war community or even the post-war community before 68, then really it's apples and oranges. It's really hard to compare. But if you just are looking at the community for itself after 68 as, a, um, as its own entity, then there's something interesting to say. So, um, 
Other scholars, of course, Antony Polonsky has written a bit about this period. Um, there are, uh, there's a historian in Szczecin that's written about the social and cultural association um, even after 68, uh, though mostly his work is before 68 and, and scattered others. Um, but there's not, there's not a ton of good, a good research, August Grabski um, and others. And um, I'll be happy to send um, the individual uh, um, some, some sources if that person is uh, interested. Um, we we share um, we share the Q and A with you so that you have uh, you have the name uh, and the emails of those who send questions. Um, and and now the second question um, is: What did Jewish religious life or support for instilling such look like outside the major urban centers? Okay, this is another uh, wonderful question. So it becomes clear that there are certain. There are certain places that cannot make a minyan. They can't make uh, they can't make a quorum of ten to have uh, services to pray, and so you'll have scattered pockets of people coming together. So this is the case in Lublin, for instance. Jews from in the Lublin region all sort of come together either for Shabbat and then increasingly just for the high holy days. Um, it's very very limited. Um, their access to anything Jewish is extremely limited outside of these centers, but it's not as if there's no contact between Poland and the so-called West. This is again, another misnomer of sorts that there's the Iron Curtain and nothing penetrates the Iron Curtain. That's, that's not the case. So, there, so, so Books come from the United States. Tra people travel from Israel to Poland and bring things. Um, almost everyone has relatives in Israel or, else, or in, in other parts of Europe and they're contacting them. People spend time abroad, um, those who have a bit more resources. So to some extent it's supplemented, um, but access to Jewish resources outside of Warsaw, Wrocław, Krakow Woods are extremely limited. Um, the JDC tries to send sort of itinerant rabbis that they hire through other people who push the agenda. So there's a, a, a rabbi, Dr. Isaac Levine from New York, who was formerly from Woods. He was a pre-war politician. He was on city council in Woods for the Second World War. And and he becomes a professor of Jewish history. He's sort of a big shot in the, uh, in the Agoda Sarabonim in New York. And he's always looking to try to send rabbis to Poland and to go to these smaller places to try to bring kosher food um, or to bring, or to bring uh, circumcisers, mo mohalim, um, to these smaller places when there are children born, um, young men born. Uh, but, but very limited access outside of the centers and in the centers, sometimes very limited. Um, and actually I have, I have my own question here. Um, you mentioned that uh, in Krakow, for instance, there were traditionally always two setters. Uh, and so my question has to do with differences even between large cities like, um, was it sounds like there was more observance in Krakow, for instance, than in, in Warsaw, or is that we can draw that conclusion or? I'm not sure we can draw the conclusion. I would say that the Yakubovich family is entrenched more probably than anyone in Warsaw. Um, that's what I can say. So they are put, they're trying at least to some extent um, salvage Jewish life there um, in, a, in a limited form. Um, sometimes it's very clear that it's a show. So there are documents from the JDC that where um, Mr. Yakubovich, who's the head of the Jewish community in, in uh, Krakow, will talk about, we have um, four synagogues that are active. And this is not true, but, it, but, they, but it's a bit of a show. It's um, to, to increase aid uh, ostensibly. This is a very poor population with limited opportunities. And so, it's it's it it it's 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 hard it's hard to tell um, uh, if there was greater observance in one place or the other. I can say that on average, about a hundred, well, ninety to a hundred people would come 
to the Passover Seder in Krakow. We have a, a wonderful document in the JDC archives that lists the number of people that attended the different Seders. Um, and we have that basically because the JDC paid for it. So they want to know how much they're paying, uh, which is which is wonderful in a sense. They're keeping tabs on that. It also gets into the, the question, which someone will probably ask about how many Jews are, are in Poland at this point. And, and, and I can save that for, for later if someone is interested. Um, so I see that we also have a question of post, um, post 19. Oh, actually we have, we have another question that's, uh, yeah, that I'm going to, to ask another question. Um, the question is, this appeared to be largely a man-centered story. What was the role of women in fostering and supporting collective Jewish religious life? Okay, that, this is a, that's true. It is a largely men, male-driven story, but not exclusively. I, I, I refer to Ruzia Yakubovich, um, who's in, very important um, for Krakow. I referred to Monika Krajewska, who is extremely important in the Warsaw context. But yes, when we're talking about an elderly religious quasi-observant, they do what they always did, whether they were Shomer Shabbat, observant of Shabbat in its entirety, probably not. Most people weren't, but this is what they always did. This is, this is an older Jewish population that comes to the synagogue, and, and in this context, that is quite male. Uh, uh, oriented, but it's not exclusively the case. And increasingly in the younger generation, the so-called return ease, the new Jews, this is, I would say, a more, um, a more diverse and balanced group. Um, so now we have some post-1989 question. Um, and the first one is, could you give some sense of how what you described has played out since 1989? Sure. So um, today in Warsaw, there's uh, a Jewish school, uh, K through eight, and they actually even started a high school recently. That is the product of these young returning Jews in the 1980s who decided that they wanted their kids to have a Jewish education, Jewish education and started uh, ostensibly a kindergarten preschool. Um, that's them. They did that at the end of the 1980s. Uh, and that materializes fully in Warsaw in, in after the fall of, of communism. And it's quite a large, uh, very well-regarded Jewish day school. Um, I don't, I don't, at the offhand, I don't know um, its uh, exact um, uh, number of students there. So that's one thing. Um, perhaps most significant if we think about the continuity of Jewish, of Jewish life is that there are young people being raised as Jewish and Judaism is not a taboo, people can make the choice uh, whether to be Jewish or not. It is not something that one has to keep hidden. Um, and that is extremely significant. Um, there, there, there are others. The museum in Warsaw, Pauline is of course a consequence of many of the players who, um, who were active in the 1980s. Um, and there's new developments that are in some senses not, not connected to, to 1989. I mean, there's a whole larger um, dynamic of Jewish cultural heritage and preservation, which I didn't talk about. That's also all over the archives about synagogue restoration projects, cemetery preservation. A lot of that stuff gets started in the 1980s. The foundations and institutions are established even in the night, some in the 1980s, and they're already active restoring synagogues and cemeteries in the 1980s. And now, of course, the Jewish community um, has the, the foundation for the preservation of Jewish heritage. Um, but in a sense, that also starts in the pre communist period in the 70s and 80s. Um, we, we have. Um... We have a remark here from, from someone who says, by the 1990s, there were fewer than five students at the Lauder School who had two Jewish parents. So I think... Um, well, oh, that, 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 that may be the case. I, I, I don't know the, the background of the parents, whether they are what, two Jewish parents, one Jewish parent, but we, have, we can't, again, the comparison point can't be what a normative Jewish community is 
in New York or Jerusalem. This is Poland emerging from the, from the Holocaust in which 90% of its population is brutally murdered. Then most of that population leaves or is expelled. And you have those Jews who stayed, those remaining Jews, and, and the reason they stay is because um, one, they may be married to a non-Jewish spouse. They may be too old to leave. They have no relatives. Their entire family was killed in the Holocaust. And where are they going to go? At least they have an apartment. So the, our comparison point has to be, um, it can't be what we think of as sort of a normative Jewish community in New York. Although to a large extent, I would say in the post-89 context, Warsaw is a normative Jewish community. Krakow, not so much. It's still utterly dependent upon tourism, really to make its Jewish community, though it's emerging there too, but Warsaw is more or less a normative Jewish community with all the problems a normative Jewish community has uh, with infighting and disputes, but also wonderful things with multiple synagogues and opportunities to be Jewish. A few people are asking how many, how many Jews live in Poland or, yeah or how many people identify as Jewish in today's Poland, I guess. To, to, today's Poland or yes. Poland of the yes. 70s and 80s? In today's today's Poland. Poland, yeah. So that's also, a, it's, so it's hard to know. We know that the Polish census says about 8,000, but that's clearly an underestimate by a long shot because um, there are more people, members of, more members of Jewish institutions than the census records are Jewish. So why, so some people may be afraid to identify as Jewish. Also Poland has a funny business with first and secondary identities. So you may, you may not actually put that you're Jewish, you identify as Polish. And then your Judaism may be something which is more cultural or what, whatever, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be represented in the census. I tend to think based upon demographers uh, and sociologists that there's about 30,000. But there are estimates that range upwards to 100,000. I think that's an overestimate. But I think we can solidly say that there are 30,000 Jews in Poland, mostly concentrated in Warsaw, in Krakow, Łódź, and Wrocław. Great. And I think this will be my this will be the last question, Yoni. Thank you. We went from the uh, late 1960s to nowadays. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, and um, thank you for our audience participants for joining in, for sending uh, really very, very good questions. Um, the next JDC Archives uh, webinar will take place on July 18. Joshua Tapper will give a lecture on the JDC in the Soviet Union between 1989 and 1991. The invitations have already been sent um, and you can also sign up for the program via GDC Archives Facebook page. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again, Yoni. It was a pleasure. Thank you.